Jamie Oliver HQ here in London, um, which is also the home of Bite Back 2030. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. My name is Liz. I'm an editor and partner at Tortoise Media. And tonight's thinking is all about what we've called the great food swindle. We're trying to get our heads around the gap between what we think we're eating and what we're actually eating and to understand how those prejudices in the food industry come about and what we can do to keep up the pressure and the good work that is happening to narrow that gap and to help ourselves be more mindful and more informed about the types of choices it's a loaded word, we might come to talk about that in a second, we think we're making about what we're putting on our plates and in our mouths, particularly through um, the frame of children and young people. And to get us started with this evening's conversation, I'm going to come in a second uh, to Christina, who's sitting next to me. For all the people who've joined us from home, um, now is the time to activate the smell -o vision control on your Zoom settings, because down there, there's a whole bunch of talented chefs who are cooking dinner for us. And if you're having mac and cheese or whatever it is you're having sausage and mash, I hope you enjoy it very much while we're chatting away here. Um, you can join in in the chat as always, and I will pick out the best comments from people from home and I'll put it to our panel and people in the room. Um, Christina, hello, how hello. are you doing? I'm doing well, thank All you. good. Um, we're here to talk about what we've called the great food swindle, and you are the co-chair of the youth board at Bite Back. I wonder if you might just set the scene for what we think we're talking about. Who are the swindlers? Who are the swindlees? What is all this to do with? Right, so we all know the main culprits when we talk about the food system and the baddies, right? The so-called baddies, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, whatever. But our issue is when we don't know who the baddies are. And when we look at a packet of whatever it is, healthy nature bar, and it's, it's showing naked, it's showing smoothies and, and innocent. But what does that actually mean? Because when I look at the sugar intake, I'm still having the same amount as a Coca-Cola. And uh, we did some research recently because um, what I feel can be one thing, but the research needs to back it, right? 73% of young people think they eat healthily. Can someone guess what the reality actually is? without looking at your <laughs> 20 30 40 lower 13. no no six percent six percent are actually meeting um the government standards and so that's what we're talking about when we say the great food swindle young people are completely illusioned by what's going on we are not being um, told the truth and we need to change that so christina it might seem like an obvious question but why should we care because i know the work that white right though really looks not into just the facts of what's in the food we eat and how it varies relative to what it says on the packet what you're expecting to find but what it what it means for your wider well-being physical mental etc so I just turned 18 and um, I can't call myself a child anymore, even though I still feel like one. But um, growing up in London, uh, where I live, I'm twice as likely to develop obesity um, and I'm likely to die around 10 years earlier than someone that lives in a more affluent area. What does that mean? So on my walk to school, I go to school in Westminster, but I live in Lambeth. Um, in my local area, I can see tons of street advertising for junk food. Um, there's loads of junk food stores. I live in a food desert, so there's no healthy, nutritious food at an affordable price. And then I walk into Westminster across Vauxhall Bridge and there's a prep, there's Leon, um, there's tons of food that people like me can't afford. Um, I go on my phone, there's advertising on all my social media apps, even emails. I get emails. Emails. <laughs> Deb says something um, that really made laugh. He gets more um, emails from Uber Eats than his grandma. So, anyway, what I'm saying is, I want you to envision the life that I live. 
I go to school, I'm bombarded. I'm on my phone, I'm bombarded. I'm with my friends. The default option is let's go for a McDonald's because it's what, lunchtime pizza or burger. Mm. If I say let's go try some new foods, they're looking at me like, what the hell? Salad? No. They, they don't know what healthy food means because we've been marketed to and, and been told that all we can eat is junk food. That's what's accessible to us and that's what we're trying to change. Thanks, uh, Christina. It's a very potent picture that you paint of the kebab shop. I mean, my brother has his local kebab shop as one of his friends and family, most style phone numbers, so um, he's nearly 50, so I don't think he counts his phone anymore. Jamie, um, this this campaign, the one that Bite Back Earl sort of soft launching today, I mean, it's not your first radio when it comes to campaigning for systemic change in the food industry, particularly about uh, children and young people's uh, nutrition. You've been at this for years in the nicest possible way. Um, why is the way we eat and the food industry so sort of stubbornly resistant to change, do you think? Um, that's quite a big question. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I, I think, you know, we live in a democracy and uh, we're a capitalist society and everyone deserves to earn a living. And I think as an overwhelming sort of thought, it's really at what cost, as a metaphorical thought, like at what cost is it okay to smash it and grow a business from this to that? Mm. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, certainly when we drove the Sugary Drinks um, uh, documentary and campaign uh, and, and, and work with government to get legislation on, on taxing, mm. we, we could see that voluntary uh, meeting of standards hadn't worked. Mm. And often that's the case. Mm. Um, so really it was designed to be a reformulation turbocharge, mm. which probably in the world it is the best example of. Mm. Um, so we reduced very, very quickly the amount of empty and useless calories. We knew that sugar was a single most, uh, the kids, sugar, sugary drinks was the single largest uh, amount of sugar in a kid's diet. We knew that these cute businesses, I grew up in a pub serving drinks, you know, they were designed as a treat and it turned into hydration. So I think at what cost mm. is really for parents to think about mm. when they're busy, busier than ever, and, and the structures of family have changed over the last 30 years. And government, at what cost? Mm. We wouldn't want to go to any game or football and not have a referee. So I, I think, you know, we live in, in, a, in, in, a, in a government and a place uh, and a society where there's concept of nanny statism, mm, mm. but none of us would want to take legislation on smoking, on the tyres on your car or on, on, on seatbelts, the quality of your water, you know, and legislation and concepts of nanny states. And by the way, good nannies are good. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good nannies bring up good kids. Yeah. And, 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 and so, so I really feel that it is, and partly tonight is, it is about amplifying the conversation of yeah. what is newly required or requested mm -hmm. logically from government, business, the community, small and large, medium-sized businesses. And, and, and actually, um, I think for most businesses, they're pretty forward thinking, but if there's not some legislation or threat of legislation, that idea of a fair playing field mm -hmm. is out there. So you have all kinds of behavior yeah. and uh, progress is slowed down massively. And do you think to that point about the next phase of the combination of the legislative environment, of all of those things you just listed, do you think that the national food strategy is getting there? What are the, the, the sort of ch chunks of, of new ideas in there that you think, yes, that's going to be the big, a big new frontier? Uh, that piece of work was commissioned to get truth. Mm. And that piece of work was taken in and was, you know, received subjectively by different people in different ways. But hopefully it's the truth. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's some solutions in there, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. but there might be better ideas to be had, but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. And you might not like it, but it's what's got to happen. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we digest that, that piece of work? Mm -hmm. How do we choose the bits that we can get over the line quickly? Mm -hmm. and, and how do we get everyone on the same page? I mean, no, no one wants to take away anyone's choice. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, you know, what you said so eloquently is the concept of choice is the most interesting part of this mm. we live in a democracy we have choice no you don't if there's only crap in a vending machine you don't have choice if there's only crap in that kind of supermarket you don't have choice if there's only crap in a, in, in a dinner hall dinner lady tuck shop you don't have choice mm. if there's if there's a food diet 
if, if there's a, if there's a if it's a food type, if there's a food desert in your postcode, you don't have choice. Mm -hmm. So don't talk to me about choice if there is none. So I, I think again the role of everyone is to try and I mean, even if us were left to make a true choice, we'd be in a better place than we are now. So mm -hmm. I think um, and I think with true choice you get fairness. And with fairness, you get more hope. And with more hope, I think you can have a really progressive, modern, contemporary, healthy country that the sky is the limit. And, and I think, which is what we see in this lovely young lady, right? This is, we, we want to live in a country where anyone can thrive, not depending on what school they went to. So hard work, common sense, and, and heart and soul, and, and do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's, and what's that got to do with food? Everything. Mm, mm. Everything. Yeah, food is so much about um, how you how you feel. I want to pick up on this sort of choice thought um, with Ali and um, Alessandra Bellini is, is chief chief customer officer at Tesco, um, and you're the executive sponsor, I think, of the DNI um, stuff at Tesco too, and obviously a partner with Bikeback and have been for some years. Um, so, Alessandra, you, you come from the world of um, you know, give the customer what they want. And, you know, in a huge and very powerful and influential uh, factor in all of our food lives, I imagine everybody here has been to a Tesco probably in the last week or so in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and obviously, you know, consumers are increasingly attuned to retailers and brands and commercial organisations, responsibility credentials around sustainability and zero carbon and inclusion and all of that. And I just wonder, with that ever expanding to do list that is broadly part of the responsible business agenda, if I can call it that, where does this frame in Tesco world? Wow, another big question. <laughs> um, look, let's start from the very basic. Um, for us to thrive, we need to listen to our customers and serve them well. Over 36% of our customers are families with young children, so that makes a good business case. 87% of customers say eating healthily is really important for me, and nearly 8 out of 10 people expect supermarkets to help them. Mm -hmm. So there's a business reason, there's a moral reason, but even if we didn't have that, but we do. There's a, customers expect supermarkets to help. Now, the real question is how do we help? Do we need to wait for legislation? Do we do it our own choice? Do we give choice? Do we take away choice? Just four things. Um, Tesco was the first retailer to take away fizzy drinks from checkout areas in 1994. There was no legislation about that. We took away chocolates and sweets from checkout in 2014. There was no legislation about that. That competitively can put you in a bit of a pickle. Um, and then we offered 100 million pieces of free fruit for kids when we understood that that could have been a good thing while people, while parents are shopping to entertain in a good way. And three months ago, we did our first campaign to help children that live in food poverty. There are 3 million families in the UK. In the UK, they have children that live in food poverty with an activity where if people bought any piece of fruit or vegetable of any kind, chilled, fresh or frozen, we would donate the equivalent amount of a meal we donated, we collected and donated over 3 million meals. So the commitment and the importance is there in the fact of what we do. We always like to walk before we talk, it's a bit of a mantra. It's really important, but there is so much more that we need to do. Yeah, um, I didn't know that about the fizzy drinks, so it's, it's a good, 94, did you say 94? Yeah. That was, yeah, interesting. Um, so, Ali, when you think about, I, I'm genu it's genuinely interested to know when you're in the boardroom and you're having these conversations, like you say, commercially taking a call of, let's get the chocolate off the checkout. That's a big call for a yeah. commercial. How do those kind of conversations pan out? Who's championing them? Like, I, I'm genuinely interested to know that how it feels to get something like that through. Well, I, I smile because there's quite a few colleagues here from Tesco and you'll know the best ideas have come from all kinds of places, rarely from the boardroom. <laughs> 
they come from our colleagues on the shop floor who know and see the families. They see what customers want, what they struggle with, what they ask for, what they wish they had. They come from them being uh, Tesco employees in the UK, 290,000 people. So we kind of see the country through our colleagues. They come from the colleagues that develop products that understand what's needed. The real conversations that we have is how do we make it, how can we make a real difference? How can we use our scale for good? And how can we retain comp comp competition and competitiveness? So those are always the things that we balance. Inevitably, every time we've taken a bold choice and we've been clear about it, we've not suffered from, from, from not being competitive. So it does take a little bit of guts and that's where I suppose the exact conversations come in. But if you, as a general rule, if you follow what customers tell you they need, you can rarely do wrongly. And as we heard, I, mean, I guess one of the big messages that this campaign is trying to land, um, it's not about food labeling. You talk a lot about you know, traffic lights and nutrition. It's not, it's not that, it's a conversation that's about marketing. And in my old life, I was a marketer, born and raised in making people think that they need things and look for the insight and build a proposition and all of that good stuff that marketers do. And when we hear from Christina that young people in this, in this context are very motivated by a health marketing message, it's super attractive as an organisation to go, well, let's put the 100% fruit bit really big and, 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 des and design a around that. And I don't know that if we're having a conversation about unwiring marketing as a concept, I feel like that's quite a big ask. I mean, it, it is, it, it, it's, there's obviously other ways that we can do that, but this is a commercial conversation at the end of the day. Well, it is. I think there's two things. One, first of all, you need to have the right approach to your product development, to how you merchandise, how you make it easy for customers. The key barriers to eating more healthily is that people fear lack of taste. They're confused because there's too much stuff going on about what's healthy and what's not healthy. They think it's bland, they think it's too expensive, and they can't find it. So our job in totality, not just as marketeers, is to make it easy to find, to navigate it and recognize it, to have the right products that have been formulated to be tasty, but also have less of the things that are not good for you. And ultimately then to communicate it. And that's the last point. And to make it really affordable. When we started to talk to Jamie about our partnership, I felt, so this is me coming in and seeing Jamie Oliver for the first time, quite in awe of all of this. And then I said, no, Jamie, I would really like to work with you, but I don't want you to be a testimonial for our ads. I really want us to work on a partnership to promote healthy eating. And I remember Jamie looking at me and going, mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I think that's really, really important. It's much less about doing pretty ads. We do a lot of pretty ads and they are all about inspiring customers to eat whatever we think is the right thing. We've just done a, a new campaign where we help people put a little bit more vegetables in their plate through a fun and engaging story. We are not here to tell people what to do. It's not our job, but we're here to inspire them, make it affordable. All of our healthier options are same price as the unhealthy options. We've taken the prices down because that is a problem when you have the sugar-free or fat-free or whatever, and it's more expensive than the regular one. So we've taken the prices out to make navigation easy. And then we do some communication to inspire people. And then we have wonderful partnerships. Yeah. And um, I just want to remind the room, please don't be shy. I'd love to see some hands going up with some points of view and challenges if you want to do for, for the people um, on the stage. I might come to Paula in a second. Um, she's over there. She's trying to hide behind the pillar, but she's made herself known to me, so she can't escape um, for, in, in a second. But before I do that, um, I might just quickly with Jamie and, and um, Christina, the Bite Back work we were prepping for this evening, the team at Bite Back um, explained some things to me that as an ordinary punter going up and down the aisles of Tesco's doing my weekly shop, I hadn't understood about the sorts of things that we're used to seeing on food packaging to do with 50% less flour doesn't mean what I thought it was, which is I thought it meant 50% less, let's say salt, than this thing had in before. But it doesn't mean that, does it? It means something different. Yeah, so um, I would 
like to read a couple more statistics out. Um, 89% of young people think yogurts are healthy. I thought yogurts were healthy until I saw this. 85% <laughs> think smoothies are healthy. 80% think cereal bars are healthy. And 63% think no added sugar claims makes the product healthy. Isn't this shocking? Don't, don't you think that there's something seriously wrong with the fact that we are literally being misled and the products that we are choosing to be healthy aren't. Um, and I think this is, I'm, I'm so glad you said what you said earlier about and um, trying to make those options clearer because um, when I go to whatever supermarket it is, I am seeing this advertised to me as the healthy option. And, and that's why we try to refrain at buyback so much from using the word option, uh, choice, sorry, because it's not a choice. When we do try to choose, it's still the same thing. It's still the same option. So um, I think that's, that's ultimately um, the, the point that we're trying to make with this campaign. It's that no matter what it is, it's the same. And we need to be um, told the truth, as Jamie has very correctly pointed out. Um, and we are deliberately misled into doing something that is wrong, essentially. So. If I can add to that, I mean, I think, um, so, so the, yeah, is it okay to scream that something's high in fiber if it's over, you know, half or a day's allowance of self fat sugar? You know, that doesn't feel there's a logic. So I think now we're out of Europe, you know, Europe did have its complexities when it came to labeling. And I remember going to um, the select committee and I literally sat down, I had the biggest drinks manufacturers in front of me, I did the nutritionals, right, and the nutrition and the volume wasn't, the nutrition was to do with half the bottle to start off with, and then you had specific drinks that were specifically for kids, and the nutrition was for adults, and it was half the bottle. Um, so all I did with my son was cut out little spoons of 13 and 12 and stick them on the same product that's always been there, and I put it around a very intelligent select committee of scientists and experts, and they all went, wow. <laughs> the same information always been there, I just told the truth. <laughs> and the reason that, and we did a massive poll uh, that went huge, uh, where it was absolutely clear as a bell that uh, with regards to that meeting with sugary sweet drinks, um, a little teaspoon and a number would be what parents want that are busy. And it's not telling anyone what to do, it's just truth. And we couldn't do it because of European legislation. So I think just to add to that, you know, we 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 are now sat on a court outside of Europe, whether we like it or not, and there are some possible advantages. So I think you know that narrative around um, how can we label things better? Like again, the rules of the game. You don't want a feral game or anything. So is it okay to champion one nutrient if there's several others that are negative? And, and I think the, the, the same answer is no, but of course, and why does it matter? Well, it matters when mum and dad and kids are all running around really busy, juggling a million things, trying to make quick decisions. It's not going to stop them having a burger or a drink, but if they rattle it out 10 times in a week or a day, at least they're getting the idea that maybe they're going this way not them, and not that way. And, and to kind of finish that point, in a funny kind of weird way, cake is very honest. Cake has never lied to you, has it? When has cake ever lied to you? <laughs> never. So when you go down the cereal aisles, uh, and it could be the, the granola bars, and it could be the smoothie, it takes very little to make them healthy. They can all be wonderfully healthy. But, uh, but it seems, you know, as we all know, air, sugar, um, and fat is, is, is cheap to sell. So uh, I think, again, truth. But, I, I, you know, in everything that I've done, I think, you know, us lot, us humans, we're, we're pretty amazing at times, we're kind of mad at times, but generally when you give people, communities, countries, good, clear information, they largely make decent choices. And you can see young people do that with the climate movement. Mm. Um, you've seen how there's been a whole youth break around the world rise up because we were told the truth and we had the facts right in front of us and we knew what to do with it. No one had to tell us to speak out. We did it. You see it with the racial justice movement. Young people are the ones leading all the forces for change in the world right now. And in my personal opinion, the only reason why we haven't seen the same with food is because we're not being told the truth. That's as simple as it is. Because when I had my first training day at Right Back, and when every other young person at Right Back had their first training day, 
We were all angry. I'm still here. I started when I was 15 and I'm still coming and I don't believe me. <laughs> um, and it's because I'm angry and I want to keep campaigning and I'm not being told the truth. And young people around me, despite all my campaigning, are still not seeing the truth because it's not what's mainstream. So that's what we need to change. Thanks so much. Um, if you're, I'm going to come in here to Paula, it's a little bit there in the white hair shirt that has her hand up too. Oh, let me just check the mic. Is that working? I think it, it doesn't work in here, but I had Ah, okay. I'm going to have to shout. So, hello, everyone. I'm Paula McKenzie. I'm the MD of KFC in the UK and Ireland. Uh, guest here by myself. Hope everyone appreciates that it's in the spirit of all of that. So, um, I've been the MD since 2017, so about four and a half years. Uh, I'm also a mother, I have two kids myself, one has severe food allergies, just to put that all into context. Um, I really liked where you were just ending that conversation then on honesty and transparency, okay? And so something that I've always tried to do, and I'm sorry I can't see you guys with the pillar, so I'm happy to stand up because that's just awkward otherwise, um, is be that honest brand, honestly, in terms of trying to label, communicate, give the information, everything about that it is KFC ultimately. We are KFC above the door, fried chicken is literally in our, in our title, um, and help people understand what is in that chicken and chips. We were, and I, I'm gonna sound like I'm a kind of one woman PR show for, for KFC, which I guess I am, but bear with me on this. Like, so, you know, over 10 years ago, we were probably the first food on the go brand to put full calorific labeling on our menu boards, like absolutely fully everywhere. everywhere. If you walk into a KFC, it's fully labeled. Um, you can eat the chicken Philip burger for 450 calories. There's not many even packet sandwiches equivalent that you can eat for 450 calories. Uh, we were one of the first brands, I know Jamie knows this too, to take any form of palm oil or um, extra hydrogenated fat oil out of any of our products. We use a high oleic rapeseed blend. That's as best as you can get in oil. Um, what else can I tell you? We took salt off our fries. We've changed our chips to be a, chunk, a chunkier, thicker fry with skin on. If you've been to a KFC recently, I'm guessing maybe a lot of you haven't, but it's a thicker, chunkier fry that is less calorific. It took about 20% of calories out. Um, it has the skin on, et cetera, et cetera. We've, in my, in my recent tenure, we've introduced mashed potato at 90 calories. We've, we have beans, baked beans really are not that bad, all things considered. We have salad as a side salad. We have rice. We have a rice box. A rice box comes in at 450, 460 calories. So we do have all these things. And I think giving consumers, and I totally get the loaded phrase of choice, um, we sell a lot of those things. Rice box is a really popular product. We sell a shed load of our, our vegan burger. That's a corn fillet with um, the original recipe, herbs and spices around the outside. So in the right moment, at the right time, they're really commercially great. People appreciate the choice, transparent products. Um, let me go back about five, six, seven, eight years. We tried to sell a fillet grilled fillet in the oven no one bought it like literally no one bought it we promoted the hell out of this thing no one bought it so i think it will come back round as an idea timing often is everything but i'm just giving you a sense of the kind of things we don't market to children i'm just trying to pick up on some of the themes we don't market to children etc cetera, etc cetera. I'm, I'm, I'm here all evening so i'm happy to pick up on any of it <laughs> what can i usefully tell you because yeah. that's the i'd love to learn and hear what's important to people um and then also you know just dispel some of the myths i guess yeah i think it's, I think it's good and brave of Paula to rock up um with her kfc badge on um a question it's a sort of related to my marketing point, point earlier when you're when you're a marketer one of the things you think about is um frequency of purchase you know what you want is for your customer to come to your shop or your cafe or whatever and come back again and again and again do you, would do you in kfc world track that and would you ever worry about it if you would get sort of incredibly high frequency customers because you sort of know that it's a thing you're meant to have you know once in a every so often type thing um is it one of many metrics that i would have yes for sure but when you're a mainstream brand it doesn't really matter whether you're i'm making up ikea kfc you know you are serving the uk population at large so you want people to come in there'll be people there'll be people who come in regularly and there'll be people who come in what we call you know very very irregularly if that mm. makes sense and and it's not a good business model to just try and get people to come in more you're looking at like how often are they coming in but it's not just like oh we're trying to shift people up that curve to just get them to come in more regularly that's it's not really the case if that mm. makes sense 
Thanks so much. I'm yeah. going to come down. Um, Kat's going to need to run fast down to the lady with her hand um, in the air at the bottom with a uh, white shirt on. Um, Should we give him a nut? Should I take my mic over? Oh, no. no. She's got, she's got an ad voice. You got it. <laughs> Um, government's chief nutritionist so um, it's been really interesting listening to all this and I really welcome bite back pushing on health claims research clearly shows that a product with a health claim customer people overrate the healthfulness of the product and it leads to maximum confusion so that's absolutely spot on um, there was planned legislation on this in the EU it never got enacted because of various things <laughs> Um, but clearly there's an opportunity to rethink that. I just wanted to reflect a bit on the food label though, because at the moment we have, we have front of pack food labeling in the UK that is voluntary. And what research shows that front of pack labeling does help some people make healthier choices, but we have a very uneven playing field at the moment. So I would suggest that uh, in a sense, it. The, 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 we have various decent forms out there that we could have on the, the food label, but the but those food labels will only influence choice to a certain extent, mm -hmm. and actually pushing it back to marketing and advertising is really important. That legislation is hopefully progressing, but we do need a vote to go through in Parliament for it to come in, and continuing to campaign for that is the right thing. I suppose I did want to ask Ali a question, and it was, yes, Tesco's have done lots of great stuff, but they also sell a broad range of products that are not any definition of health, and you're promoting them and, uh, and advertising them. And I always say to chief executives of retailers when I meet them, what's your red line? What's your red line? So you took away the sugary drinks from your larger checkouts, not from your smaller store checkouts. Um, you took away your high sugar drinks, Tesco's own brand, but not the other ones. So where are your red lines? What's your red line on a breakfast cereal? Because actually you are influencing the choices, the options of people who come in the store. We don't suddenly develop an addiction for chocolate. We do it because it's being marketed and promoted to us all the time. So yeah, so I'm quite interested to kind of push you along a bit and get you to think about your red lines. Well, yes, of course. I mean, these are the conversations we have all the time. And it's always that balance between the choice, what customers want, what you can sell, what you think is the right thing to do. We decided two years ago to remove multivise from Easter eggs, for example. That was a big decision. Yes, we of course we sell Easter eggs, but we've decided to remove the multi-buy, so buy three and pay less or, or, or volume. Um, we've removed all the volume promotions from unhealthy foods, um, like chocolate, like sweets, etc. Um, but ultimately, we serve the country a bit like uh, Paula was saying, we serve the country and the nation. We want to make it easy to make that choice. We want to give it the navigation in store. We want to We've done a whole campaign every year about healthy, healthful little swaps. We can't say healthy, healthful little swaps because they're not necessarily healthy to your point, Christina. But if they are re um, reduced sugar, fat or salt, they will be better than the equivalent version. So we try and make it easier for customers and every now and then we will make some of those difficult decisions ourselves. We do use our influence with our supplier partners as well to go along the way by the way because if tesco takes out all the sugar is we're already 17 months ahead of the legislation on sugary drinks on all of our own brand and we use that to put pressure on our supplier partners as well can i ask a question Abby? i mean i think um what's that's a really interesting question coming from yourself working with the government and, and we've got people from government here to, today and there's always that debate and fine line between business and government sure. and who, when, why, what. And all I would say is that as far as the red lines are concerned, um, look, we've, we've heard very eloquently from the MD of KFC what's been done. But actually, if you want to look at, from a public health point of view, like the volume of fried chicken is not coming from KFC, it's coming from all the independents and the laggards and all the Wild West that's happening out there. So I'm sure there's still work to be done. But, you know, mm -hmm. like, it's OK to ask you or her what the red line is but I think well, okay so where's the government's red line 
because I, I think what business wants at its very most basic is fair playing field for everyone to be commercial within those rules. So where do you, is it helpful to you to have clear red lines from the government or what is it down to the individual? And by the way, just, just for clarity, your average CFO, CEO, uh, COO has the same average term in their job as government, which is about four years on average, unless you're doing very well. <laughs> just about four and a half years, is it time to go? Um, questions as an approach we want to work with government and all of its subsidiaries and, and, and public health England especially what really helps us is consistent legislation across all the nations we're a, we're a you know a national retailer we need to sell everywhere what really helps us is clear legislation and then we we want to be a really active partner in working out what that means for the customers in using the insight that we have from our customers for the benefit of that legislation. So we do want to work together. So, so we want clear legislation and we want it to be consistent everywhere. So having clear red lines from government, is do you feel that that has more sustainable impact as far as, because what I don't think, one of the things in the work that I've done that's always bothered me is how much luck was involved in that thing getting over the line. How much came down to that day, that moment, that, that corridor conversation. Like you don't want stuff to be better in Tesco because you've met Ali. Right, I mean, Ali's lovely, but like, and, it, and it's not even the board. It like, I, I think, I think like you could say culture or, or or values, but there's no point in having one business doing one thing and another doing another. When do you know what I mean? So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, how important do you think wild the wild west versus clarity from government around the, I guess the rules of play? Yes, of course, hugely important. Like you do important in two ways. One is collaborating with the government, working together to exchange what we hear about the market, what we know about the products, what we know about how customers shop, because behavioral science is a really tricky subject and we need to pull together. This is this challenge, we're not gonna win at Tesco by ourselves. We're not gonna win just with buyback. It's about bringing everyone together and being very clear about the outcomes. And then it's about the, co the corporate values and your core purpose and for us is to actually serve our customers our communities and the planet a little better every day. Thank you everyone. Lots of people wanting to join in in the room. We're going to go over here to hear from one of the Bite Back younger people, I think, and then to Dr. Chris, who's just by cat, and then to Susanna in the stripy dress. So go for it, your turn first. Let us know who you are. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Jacob, I'm 17, and I'm on the Bite Back Youth Board along with hi, Christina. I wanted to talk about a story from when um, we had our training days a few weeks ago in the six week summer holidays. Um, we were there at, I can't remember where it was, we were at a location, uh, we were there working, doing some training, catching up, um, and whilst we were there, they had a big fridge which had a bunch of different snacks and drinks that we were allowed to go and pick at, grab whenever we wanted. Uh, one of these drinks that we all loved was called Innocent Bubbles, um, which the name itself is quite funny. Um, because it's this canned drink, it's like a fizzy fruit drink. Um, it's got loads of pictures of fruit and really vibrant colors on the front. It's very, very appealing to young people. And um, we all loved it. We were drinking them loads. I had two in one day, like <laughs> back to back pretty much um, because they were, they were really nice. Um, but they were marketed to me as healthy when in actual fact they weren't. There were, as I said, there were lots of fruits, lots of bright colors on it. Uh, there were also claims on it. Uh, said they were vegan. It was um, one of them was that they not only taste good, but also do good. It's something that's written on the front of the can. Yeah, it has 20 grams of sugar in one can. That's two thirds of my sugar intake in a day gone in one can. And I had two cans back to back <laughs> because I thought it was healthy because of that's the way that the industry marketed it towards me. So my question to anyone from the panel um, is, do we need corporates to step up and change the ways that they're marketing or their labeling or anything like that? Or do we need government legislation to come in? Good question. What do you reckon? I, I just think um, uh, this is absolutely the time post-COVID, uh, post-Brexit, to, to have a clarity and a consistency on labeling so that everyone, no matter what they're doing, has at least one language to speak. Um, so whether it's a teaspoon that would have had, you know, 12 on it, 
um, or whether it's colour. Um, I, I just think that we, we've been dithering around on this for years and years, and, and, and the question is, should it be voluntary? Absolutely not. We don't, we don't have any national statistics that give us any um, reason for it not to be compulsory. So I, I think, you know, it's actually boring to talk about it, I think. So, so, so we need to move on. And, and also, there's nothing progressive about this. All you're doing is telling the truth, yeah. which, is, which we all pay for. We yeah. pay for the truth, and we should have the truth. And it should be on the front, and it should be clear, and it should be one language, and that's it. Thank you very much. Um, let's go for Dr. Chris, who's just next to Kat. Uh, Dr. Chris. Hi, I'm a, a doctor in London, an academic, and my, my academic focus is on conflicts of interest and, and research integrity. Ali, I hope, I've really enjoyed listening to you speak. I hope you don't mind a slightly spiky question, if that's all right. You said earlier that you serve the country. What happens when you find, uh, and I'm assuming you meant that in, in a service, public service way, rather than a, a, a sort of customer service way. What happens when public health comes into conflict with your legal obligations to your shareholders? Do you ever make a loss in the interest of public health? Well, we've made a lot of choices that, as I said, on the face of it, would have been against potentially making higher sales, at the very least, you know, taking away chocolate, taking away fizzy drinks, removing multibuys from chocolate eggs. We do that all the time where we balance what we think is right for the customers, right for us as a business, and then what the potential consequences are overall in the business. We do understand that helping the country eat more healthily is not just good because it's a good thing, it's good for the health of the people that are our customers, it's actually better for the planet by the way, which helps with that connection with the environment. Food contributes to nearly 30% of the CO2 emissions in the, on the planet, so healthier food is, is better for everyone, it's more sustainable for everyone. But we're not alone, we need to do it with partnerships with the government, with Jamie Oliver, with WWF, with the Food Alliance, with Bike Back, it does take much more than a village to solve these problems. Um, thank you so much. Let's find Susanna. And then is Carlo here? Carlo Mocci from Deliveroo. I'd love to hear from you, Carlo, if you can. And I don't know if, Tommy, did you have your hand up as well at one point? Okay, cool. Go for it, Susanna. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susanna. I'm the chair of a multi-academy trust in the northeast of England. And one of the things that I'm really struck with is that we know we need to build healthy eating habits with children. And yet, Ofsted makes it almost impossible for schools to do the right thing. So my challenge to government is how are we going to join up the different departments in government? Because it would be so easy to say to schools, you have to be water only schools. Okay, there's no reason to have any of pseudo healthy innocent drinks or actual fizzy drinks in the schools. At the same time, we can't teach nutrition in our schools because we have to be teaching, and this is very dull for people who don't know, but there's a whole scoring called Progress 8, and it's all about your geography scores, your history scores, and honestly, I think it would be more useful for people to understand about healthy eating than the Tudor kings and queens. So my question, I suppose, is how are we going to get government to have it joined up and actually allow schools to do the things that they want to do, but they can't because otherwise they'll be graded down by Ofsted and linked with that. And I suppose this goes to KFC. And I do think it's super brave of you to be here, so all kudos, <laughs> um, is right now in the sort of area where our schools are and we serve very deprived communities, if you walk out of the school gates within five minutes walk, you are surrounded by junk food stores. So KFC might be doing the right thing, but then you have all of the other fried food, bad, unhealthy, fast food places. And if we could get government to say, actually, there's a two kilometer radius, which is junk food free, then that would make a big difference. And maybe 
some leaders in the industry can say, we'll lead a coalition that says, as the leaders within fast food, we commit not to being within that radius of the school gates. That's my thought. Yeah, I mean, it would seem to be that the sort of the comprehensive treatment is not yet there. It feels to me, and like I say, I think Paul is great, as we said, for coming, but I don't quite buy it. It doesn't feel to me yet, not just KFC, but it comprehensively across the board that we've reached the sort of level of urgency in the food industry that maybe in, I don't know, oil and gas, we feel like we've got there and I'm not, I don't feel that in the, in the room yet. I might be misreading it and, and, and maybe you, you, you can correct me. I don't know what you think, Jamie. I just think if they, were, if they were actually delivering on a robust strategy consistently, yeah. that there's plenty of good practice happening within this country yeah. and within the city. So even the mayor passed a bill where there couldn't be new licenses given to fast food operations within a certain, you know, um, meterage of, of schools and, and you can't register retrospectively go and throw everyone out but of course there's, there's loads of things that can be done of course every child should learn about food where it comes from and how it affects their body and the environment of course i mean that would be logical just to your point um but but i think one of the problems is we've had 20 years of great ideas and, and what feels like the theme to me consistently is we need consistency and when when such important sets of complex values rely on one person one council mm -hmm. it's just too vulnerable to sustainably make the impact to the whole country so that that's how it feels for me yeah go for it i've got a question um Colin, you said you said we don't market to young people last year nasa said the same thing at our feed britain better summit we don't market to young people under a certain age we beg to differ because you know we were told that cereal was great because there were cartoons on it that you know we were attracted to since the age of what like three and parents in the room probably you know know the struggle of having to take your children and at eye level it's really bright pepper pig chocolate bars and stuff like that um with kfc when i think of ads i think of hip-hop music young people um, in outfits bopping to the chicken shop. Like, it very much feels like I'm marketed to. And yet everyone's telling me, no, you're not, but I'm seeing it, it's all around me. And so what are you actually going to do to stop marketing to young people? Because I refuse to buy that you aren't, because you are, and I see it every day. Yes, yes. And then we're gonna come to, um, Tommy, and we're going to come to Carla, and we're going to come to the lady over there. And I think there's somebody in the middle as well that wants to, so we'll need to go quick. Okay. Um, the bit of do we fear legislation or whatever, I would say no, if that makes sense. High fat culture responsible for doing the right thing, bring it on, because then I think it just levels the people. I'm just trying to tackle everyone's points, because um, if you're operating responsibly, you won't have whether you sell chocolate whether you sell fried chicken whether you sell cheese do you know what i mean so in a way i generally i totally agree like i don't think i and i definitely don't i don't fear the legislation because it creates a, a level playing field uh opening in schools there's two and a half thousand primary schools in the whole country and there's about i want to say oh let's look at primary schools around all of the primary schools you basically wipe out the whole of the uk you know every high school it's kind of true when you do it on a map unfortunately like literally it is very very little pockets of the uk left because of the density of the island so i guess the solution for me has to be how can we all coexist that high streets can coexist and the schools can coexist and we don't want to just punch that genuinely on our island we have to figure out how to do this and then i'll just make my big point because if we have all the last year then you will have a duty to solve Take years. But it's not, it's, I'm here as the head of KFC. It's not, it's just responsibility KFC. Um, the love of children um, under 18. Now, I can see that some people are appealing things like picking up or uh, getting tonsils or anything else, but we don't have that happening. We don't want children. We have a kid for adults coming in with their kids. But I know that those things, I think it's, um, I think it's also working with 
cetera. So that there's less spillover, as we would call it in marketing terms, mm -hmm. into young people that find that stuff really desirable. But a lot of adults find that stuff really desirable. There's a lot of gamers that are 18 plus. Sure. And, oh, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. I think, um, thank you for, I'm just conscious of time when we only get around. Everybody, so race cats over to the other side of the room, and um, I'd love to hear from Carlo here uh, from Delivery because that's obviously been a huge shift in the way that well, some of us, I'm not saying it to me, has changed the way I eat during lockdown. And thank you for being here. Delivery is not a haven of healthy food, is my feeling, but perhaps I'm using it wrong. How do you how do you think about this in the context of your business inside of mobile phone? where a young person can order a beverage and their Well, I think we, we think about it, I think to some extent it's very similar to what a grocery retailer would, would do. Uh, our business model is a business model providing, uh, frankly, the, the most uh, large selection you can in a, in a given area. And it's, uh, it's a business that actually depends a lot on local selection. We deliver the very short distance from a restaurant to, uh, <clears throat> to consumers. So the way we think about it is about uh, developing the largest possible choice. At the same time, what we, we do is uh, to make sure that that choice is discoverable for customers. And we do that in <clears throat> a number of ways. Uh, for example, I think we were the first platform to have uh, specific tiles, which are essentially is uh, in the app where you can filter uh, and find the type of food you, you, you're looking for. Uh, and one of those ties is actually a healthy food. We have tags for vegan food. And so we depend obviously on the brands to, uh, to classify themselves as we don't measure calories. We, we, we are essentially a platform that provides access to what the brands are selling to consumers. Um, the other thing we do is uh, we do have a pretty intense uh, marketing uh, uh, campaign uh, during the year to promote a number of, um, of healthy eating habits. So, for example, uh, Veganuary uh, is, a, is a big moment for us. We have, uh, uh, we have partnered with some brands to uh, promote uh, Vegan Mondays, for example, where uh, we are trying within certain brands that maybe don't stand for healthy eating uh, per se as, as a brand image to start with, but within those consumptions to actually try to drive within the menu uh, more uh, consumption towards healthier options within their own, uh, their own menu. And some of the partners we work with uh, have announced, for example, that 50% of the menu today is vegan. And so we, we definitely have that on the agenda of all of our largest partners. I think the other thing I would add, um, a few years ago, we decided to, uh, uh, to actually introduce grocery shopping on Deliveroo. Uh, today, it represents uh, over 13% of our orders in the, in the UK. And the reason we've done that is really to make sure that, of course, we were growing our business, but also we wanted to give an option which wasn't necessarily prepared foods and maybe less uh, healthy food uh, when it comes to uh, certain types of preparation. And so if I look today at our sales, you know, we are actually quite happy to see that <clears throat> many people are ordering the fresh fruit and vegetables in the morning uh, for their breakfast. And essentially they can access uh, food that in the past you wouldn't probably think you would find on a food delivery platform. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Rich. I'm really conscious of time. I'd love to hear from Tommy before we go. And I think there was somebody in the middle here. I'm sorry. There we go. That's right. Waving your hand in the air with Tommy first, and then we'll come around to um, in the red dress. There. Oh, sorry. Can I bring one of your panelists up there? Um, I'm Tommy Myers, and I um, am a trustee of Chefs and Schools, which is a charity that started in 2018. Um, and we're calling for some really basic things, which the government still don't seem to think very important, because so many kids, the only hot meal they get um, in a day is at school. And yet 60% of secondary schools have school food that doesn't even meet the government guidelines in, health, in terms of healthy food. It's really easy to feed children healthily at school. It costs 75 pence a meal. That's how much it's costing us in 48 schools. We're trying to get into 100 schools in the next couple of years. It's not simple, but when it's not even part of Ofsted, the food doesn't even come near to an Ofsted report. You can be excellent as a school, 
and the food is not, not the, the Ofsted inspectors don't even eat lunch because it's so disgusting. They go around the corner. So how is it possible for a school to be excellent when they're not even feeding their kids basic food? And it's completely possible. I'm really interested by this idea of healthy food in the supermarket because processed food can be healthy, but ultra processed food just isn't. And all the yogurt, I see as a mother, I've got three kids. I know that 95% of them are stuffed full of sugar. I don't, I just literally don't go near them, but they're all being sold in supermarkets. So when is that legislation going to happen? We lose 70,000 people a year now to death through diet related disease. We have the worst diet in Europe. 52% of our shopping basket is ultra processed. So where's the legislation on ultra processed food? It is, it's killing us. Look at the response to COVID when all these people are dying. And yet, no one's talking about the deaths that cause more than smoking, more than tobacco. It's down to the food we eat. So surely the government has got to change the labelling, but definitely in the school schools as well. And um, and that's the campaign we're doing at the moment. At least the school food charter in schools. Thank you very much, uh, Tommy. And then let's go um, to the person in the red dress. And I think it's a green cardigan, but I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't quite tell. Fight Back Youth Board members and what I just really wanted to do was echo the notions that Christina put forward because um, as you can probably tell from all the young people here today and you would have spoken to is that we really care about this issue you know it really does matter to us yet still sometimes as young people we just don't feel heard and it's really upsetting because you know we should be able to you know eat healthily it should be easy for us to do and we do have a right to honesty because these claims aren't just morally questionable they are bad for us and um, personally for me it's really hard for my family to do right by my younger little sister who's type 1 diabetic. Things like oh, low sugar foods or no added sugars, these things are really harmful because what we are sort of led to believe is that these things are sort of good for her. And sometimes what we do, we sort of feed into that idea and we you know, do sometimes believe it. And it's something very understandable, even I believe it. And then what happens is actually sometimes it has really negative impacts on her. And that's all from an assumption that we've made. And that's something I don't want for any other individual. So that's just my younger sister toddler, but this is something that I know affects lots of different other young people, not just with health conditions. And I guess what I'm really just wanted to say was, my question was for Ali and Tesco, you are a giant corporation with a huge amount of influence over what we eat. And I'm sure you have a crazy amount of priorities to juggle. So where on your list of priorities does child health sit and how does it compare to um, climate sustainability, for example? So we've been, um, in terms of the way we communicate to our customers, we've been doing a lot more in the area of healthier, more sustainable diets that we've done on supporting the planet. Is one of the debates we have internally all the time, as part of my team is here. We started, as I mentioned, with some of the activities, but uh, ever since we partnered with Jamie, we've actually really focused every year, and we now do it always on content about healthier ways to eat providing inspiration recipes making it really as affordable as possible we provide a menu planning option every week in social and digital on our website to plan healthier meals for your family for 20 pounds for a family of four for a week we really really care it's something we've we've been introducing plant-based food i was reminded about plant-based food we have over 300 lines of plant-based food. We just launched last two weeks ago, meat and veg, the first range of products where we mix vegetables with a quantity of meat so that they're actually mixed together. That's what every parent does when they're trying to help their children to eat a bit more vegetable, kind of hide it in, in the meat. And it's now available and it's really as affordable as the equivalent meat products. So it's actually been a really big part. The truth is, it's really hard to shift behaviours. We need everyone's help. We need all of the things we've talked about here. We won't be able to do it by ourselves, no matter how much money we put behind it or much or how much we believe in it. But we will continue to do it and do it as effectively as we can. Thanks so much, um, Ali. I think we'll give perhaps Jamie a chance to say a few final thoughts. I'd love Christine to have the final word. One big ask for the people in this room, watching at home and in general, um, to the industry. I've made a couple of notes. What we try and do at Sources through these uh, discussions is uh, really what we're doing is looking for stories. We're looking for things that we can go away and get our research team on and our reporters on, things that we can usefully do to contribute to the conversation. It's been very interesting for me. I thought we would have a conversation about uh, choice, um, but the corollary of choice and maybe more what we've been talking about is kind of truth and trust, which as a newsroom, 
we like to think we're quite good at truth and trust, at least we're trying to do our best. And there are a couple of quite precise things that I think we can take away and we can look at. One of them might be those concentric circles around primary and secondary schools across the country and have a look at where the reality of that, there's a perception and there's a reality and, and, and we could have a look at mapping that with some good data work would be interesting to see what that really looks like. Um, because the sort of principle, it feels to me like the trust in the food system is a bit off. And either we need to find a way to increase public confidence in the food that they're buying so that you can believe what it says on the label and you can understand that if it's got a cartoon cabbage on the front of it, it really is healthy and all of those kinds of things. Or we're going to have to sort of bring the bar of the, you know, the, the whole thing needs to right itself. We either increase the quality or we bring the, the trust has to come down to the reality of where we are at the moment. Um, those are my thoughts. We can map those. And there's a really good question in the chat as well, which links to my concentric circles, which was about what do we know about the differences between urban and rural populations, health and general food habits. And that's something I don't know the answer. I'm sure there's brilliant people who've already done loads of work on it, but it's something that would be interesting for us, certainly, and um, to kind of surface. Um, Jamie, what's your final thought? Well, I mean, just to, to briefly tap on that, the map of poverty um, was the same map of, of um, unusual mortality in yeah. Tokyo. So I, I think what you'll find within government is that a lot of the stuff that was coming into the debate and going through consultation, a lot has been fast forwarded. So the question is what new and important things need to come in to replace that and, and then delivering on the stuff that's going through. Um, for me personally, I don't know if it's just my own uh, view, I think the concept of um, trust and choice is around the clarity of labeling. I think people often think that's just a kind of business to consumer relationship. Oh, what I do gives you, the consumer, some sort of hope. It's not just about that, by the way. If, if you're a research and development chef for any brand on the planet and you've only got reds, you're going to want ambers and greens. And if your portfolio is a rep force going out to selling stuff, uh, do you know what I mean? So I, I think that there is stuff around that that can be done. And I think where we started off the conversation was is what is choice true choice uh and it can't be between bad and bad mm -hmm. um and because that's just bad so um and ultimately we want to make our own choices and when we want a bit of cake we want a bit of cake but i, I think when you know so i think there's been loads of great things in, in the chat today and, and, I, and i guess you know my dream for tonight is is this dinner and I, I really hope that you have a lovely night tonight and for everyone that spoke thank you for speaking and, and so candidly um it is about as a collective, how can we push things on? Um, and we've got businesses, uh, we've got uh, a government here tonight, um, and hopefully the Bike Back 2030 will have their voice heard in continuing those conversations and ultimately trying to land more progress. Because ultimately, no matter where it happens, it's all about progress, so. Thanks so Christina, you're what it's all about, so you get the final word. Um, at the end of the day, one of three children in the UK are recipient obese. And I hope you feel the sense of urgency. Um, it is as urgent as any other issue that's on our minds right now. Um, and from the conversations that we've had and um, the people that are in this room, I feel very hopeful um, that we can make change and quickly. However, at the same time, you've been campaigning for almost two decades now. Um, some amazing campaigners that I know, Jeanette Ori, she's been doing it for 20 years. I don't want to be 40 years old campaigning on child rights to food. I, I don't want to do that. Um, by 2030, I want a way healthier. No offense, by the way, sorry. <laughs> um, I want a healthier food environment, food system for everyone. It, it doesn't have to be because I'm from a poorer background than some of my classmates that I get crap food. So please, please act on what we say. I don't want this to just be a conversation and don't hide what's inside. Give us the truth. There you go. You heard the word.